Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to have you here as a co-host, maybe later on, at least as someone who helps us to get it started. So it's Tuesday afternoon. It's 4 p.m. in Berlin. It's 4 p.m. our Central European summer time, and it's really summer here today. It's my pleasure to welcome you after some very busy time again to another episode of our Space Cafe 33 Minutes with Kevin O'Connor about from zombie statistics to the trillion dollar space economy. And as always, we truly appreciate uh, your participation and ongoing feedback. And we are committed to learning from your input and continuous improving our webinars to make them more engaging and more informative for you. I'm Torsten. I'm the publisher of Spacewatch.Global, a Europe-based online platform for information in it about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. And I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters in 2023 that showed their continued uh, commitment to keeping our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. I know many of you are familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and our daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcast. So don't miss NASA's Kim Arstand unraveling the universe a data, from a data storyteller point of view with our wonderful host, Markus Moslechner. We also have new episode in our Space Cafe radios featuring uh, live uh, sessions from Glock, from the Global Space Conference on Climate Change that happened in Oslo with ESA's Dr. Rune Floberg Hagen and with NASA's Susie Perisquin, um, um, Dr. Karen Sanjaman and Dr. Kate Calvin. So NASA's super women power in one room. It was very a, a delight to, to have this conversation with them. We also talked in this particular Space Cafe uh, radio about the new NASA Earth Observation Center and that's just opened last Friday. So, but as always, you heard it for first with us. And our second episode of the Space Economy Inside podcast with Matt Gilliam um, by Kevin and MR is online as well. And I know we will talk about it later on. There is, and you might have discovered we have a new logo for our Space Cafe Radio. Emma, I have to say that because it took us so long to get it done. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, and you can also all, you can find all our audios wherever you get your podcasts from. And our fan shop, last but not least, our fan shop is open for you always. It's just a click away on our website. And it's a nice way to support us actively and become a real space watcher. And if you've missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our webpage in the event section, but you can also find us on YouTube. So our guest today is someone who we are really pleased to call a friend. Like many people in the sector, we met many years ago and had an opportunity to interview him on really various occasions as he has something to say. It's always enlightening to listen to him. Last year in Paris, we sit together and developed an idea of a common podcast. And as mentioned earlier, we just published the second episode of the Space Economy Insight podcast. With that again, a very warm welcome to our Space Cafe today. And it's also for you the first 33 minutes, Kevin. Kevin O'Connell, welcome to the show. Thanks, and Torsten. Thanks, Emma, as well. It's great to be with both of you, as, as always. And, and thanks to everybody else who joined. Thank you. So just a few words about our guest today. He had a very diverse career in many sectors, in commerce, in intelligence, in research, while running a center at the RAND Corporation. He, is, uh, he spent over three decades uh, working on space commercialization, including, and as many um, know him, in his role as the director 
of the Office of Space Commerce with the U.S. Department of Commerce. And after leaving the government, he found, founded, founded uh, Space Economy Rising, an advisory firm that keeps him busier than ever before. I think that's all correct so far, Kevin? Absolutely. Then, then let's kick it off and welcome again to our show. So first, I would like to start with the title we choose for our session today, From Zombie Statistics to the Trillion Dollar Space Economy. We choose the name on purpose. It refers to an article by Shinnard O'Sullivan. I've printed it out here. I know it's not very eco-friendly, but it's easier for me to digest that article. And we choose it by purpose, um, the, the, the entire title. And this article by Shinnard uh, O'Sullivan is titled Slaying Space Zombies. And it was published on the Financial Times behind the paywall on the 12th of June this year. The phrase zombie statistics became prominent at the Financial Times Investing in Space Conference a few weeks back as coined by investor John Holtz and was then reflected in the subsequent FT op-ed by Shinnett. Can you summarize the article for, for us, Kevin, and give us your thoughts on that? Sure, Torsten. Thank you. And uh, you know, again, it's a it's a curious title for the for the thirty three minutes today. But as you say, this was a phrase, uh, "zombie statistics," that came up in the Investing in Space Financial Times conference, and was subsequently written about by Sinead in, in the op ed. And uh, you know, what it really highlights is the need to do much better accounting for developments in the space economy. And that's that's all a good thing, and it's something we all ought to strive for. I guess what what bothered me in the in the chatter that followed that was the idea that a lot of the data and the reports that people were seeing about the space economy were deliberately misleading. And, and I actually don't believe that. I think uh, you know most of the people who are trying to do this uh, are are really trying to do it faithfully. Uh, it's always important to read the fine print, as people know, and uh, it's always important uh, when you're looking at estimates to understand the assumptions and potential biases of the people that are providing the information, uh, you know, what the wild cards are and, and things like that. So in some ways, it's just applying good critical thinking to this particular sector. What they're really highlighting, though, is something that's analytically very difficult. And it's, you know, it's again, it's accounting for developments in the space economy. Uh, I actually believe personally that we're undercounting uh, what's going on in the space economy. Uh, my my typical you know, example here is to say that if I were to hold up my cell phone and say, is this a, a part of the space economy? You'd probably frown and say, no, probably not. But there are probably a dozen apps on there that are part of the space economy, navigation, communications, others, and things like that. And, and so it's it's genuinely hard. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you believe, you know, we see estimates every year from a variety of sources, Space Foundation, Euroconsult, Satellite Industry Association, and Bryce, you know, we see different estimates. They're typically different. They they tend to highlight different things. But if you do believe that we're close to a half trillion dollars, uh, it's only simple math that gets us to a trillion dollars over the next uh, 15 years or so. You know, in some years will be stronger than others. Uh, you know, we know that 2021 was a strong year. 2022 was not in the space economy. So it won't be an even growth by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but we'll definitely get there. A question of what date, you know, I, I wouldn't dare to predict. But uh, in in the rough time frame that people are writing about, I, I think that's absolutely correct. Now, people who have heard our first episode of Space Economy Insights, of course, will recall the conversation we had with Claire Jolly of the OECD, in which Claire talked about both the importance of accounting for the space economy better but also some of the efforts within the OECD and a wide range of universities and, and other organizations around the world who are actually working hard to try to put some rigor around the methods and the way we count these things. Uh, and of course, as, as some people know, uh, I helped start at the Commerce Department uh, before I left a couple of years ago, we helped start an effort which was designed by the, our Bureau of Economic Analysis to count space economic statistics in the very same way that we can account 
for national economic statistics. So this is an, an important part of the space economy. Uh, you know, we have to pay a lot of attention to it, but it's not the only piece, obviously. Got it. So maybe we can ask our audience who listened to the Space Economy Insights podcast already. So uh, maybe you can just drop it in the in the in the chat if you if you like. But let's stay in in the finance realm for a moment. Aside from the decades of government investment, our private capital is seen as one of the most important catalysts of space activities in recent years. But as you mentioned, um, it also dropped rapidly since 2021. Can you comment on that and and go into sure, that? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you're exactly right. Uh, the role of private finance has been absolutely pivotal uh, in, in fueling the space economy. And you're also right that it has dropped precipitously over the last few years. I believe the numbers that we typically use are $47 billion of private investment in 2021, 20 in 2022. And I think the best numbers we have so far in 23 for the first quarter, so cautionary note there, uh, is it about an annualized $10 million. Uh, and there are a whole range of reasons why that's the case. You know, we can look first to global macroeconomic conditions as one source. Many industries are suffering because of that. Uh, but in the space specific area, we can look at uh, the SPAC craze and some of the valuations that took place there. Uh, and we can also look at, at other aspects of, of private investment. The good news is that here in the early, mid, early to mid 2023, we're actually starting to see an uptick again in, in private investment. And there has been a shift that we should know. One is that there's been definitely a shift from the what, what's called risk investment to value investment. In other words, uh, what used to be taken on faith as, as something that was a risky investment, today is typically invested in, in areas where companies understand the market they're in, understand their competition in a lot more rigorous way, and frankly, have brought revenues across the goal line. I mean, that's one of the key discriminants in this market. There are a lot of people that still have a lot of wonderful ideas, but a key discriminant to attract private investment has actually been to have revenues come across the transom so that, that companies know that they're actually uh, uh, able to do that. Now, we shouldn't dismiss government investments in this market either. Uh, we know that 2022 was a banner year for government investment in space. And, uh, you know, topping, I think the Euro Consult number was topping $100 billion in investment. That historically was mostly exploration, although security is racing quickly up to where it's almost at a 50-50 level uh, for reasons that I think our audience, uh, you know, genuinely understands. We know that even investments in, in space security related issues will result in spinoffs. And oh, by the way, uh, while we're worried about uh, methodologies and counting, uh, government investments are also sometimes very challenging because of the security dimension of, of what's happening. Uh, and so uh, government investment is, is going to continue to be important here. And it's always been important. I mean, this is an interesting parallel between or an interesting dynamic, I should say, between government and private sector investments historically. Uh, you know, governments would provide, if you will, a technical validation that would allow a company to go out to the private capital markets to get a separate read on how much of a business people would expect to see over time. Uh, and governments have actually become better buyers uh, of activities in the space market, avoiding the quote, the anchor tenant thing that we were used to historically in the space. So there are still movements and there are still good activities to invest in in the space market and both governments and industry and private capital are investing in them. I, I hear your words, are um, especially are when, when you talked about the 2021 drop. I mean, Europe is super proud uh, in the first quarter this year, 2023, the investment in the space economy is bigger, the first time bigger than in the US. I mean, I don't want to explore what, what, what the reason is why we are that strong or not that strong. But however, so how are startups, space startups are able to finance their activities in, in Europe or all the US? 
is it similar? Is it is it different? Is this money still available just because you can spell space correctly? Yeah, I, I think we see, you know, in Europe, I you know, last week was the Paris Air Show, and we were able to see a number of developments on the on the private investment side that were actually uh, very, very important. Uh, Torsten, you have heard me, and I know Emma's heard me also say, you know, space is about economics, and that sometimes gets some weird looks at me in, in, in an audience that's a traditional space audience. Uh, and what we're really seeing is that companies that understand the business aspects of their business, you know, are likelier to get funding. In Europe, there's been a, some availability of, of uh, pandemic relief funds that are still flowing into the economy. There's also an, an intense, you know, sort of additional amount of investment. Uh, we see the European Space Agency and others having sort of unprecedented levels of investment in this area. But I think the key to startups is understanding your business, understanding your competitors, having a team that can, a diverse team that can actually execute on your brilliant scientific idea, but really understanding the business aspects of that as well, because that's where investors in the current environment are really focused. I think as, as one of the few countries in, in Europe that has the uh, COVID relief fund, Italy is, is, is one of them yep. and, and Spain. So Emma can refinance all her space activities <laughs> with government <laughs> money. So uh, Emma, we see you. Um, but instead of talking about the $1 trillion by whatever date um, we might assume, let's talk about the growth potential and the current growth. Um, Josef Aschbacher, the ESA DG, talked to me uh, in, in London about 86% growth in Europe over the four years 2017 to 2021. What does that mean compared to a, other sectors? Are we as big as we believe we are? And is that all healthy or the next bubble? So what is yours? Well, so it's hard to it's hard to compare sectors uh, only because you know in this particular sector, uh, one of the dilemmas is that it's very easy to count inputs, satellites, launches, things like that. It's much harder to calculate the outputs in this sector, and we can calculate at some crude level the outputs, but how do we measure the fact that you're more efficient because you use the mapping act? app to move from point A to point B, or that we're able to conduct this Zoom call, you know, because of space, things like that. So it's real hard to measure those. I, I'm, I'm more efficient because I'm a German, but that goes <laughs> without saying. I'm not, I'm not touching that one, actually. But, but uh, seriously, I, I think on the space economy side, what we really have to look at is the underlying factors, the continuing factors that continue to evolve in the direction that encourage the, the space economy. And what we see, entrepreneurs are pursuing innovation. Obviously, they're inspired by something that, that they're trying to do. They're inspired by what benefit it could create potentially here on Earth. But they're also trying to create efficiencies. Uh, and so remember that we're at the at the uh, I won't say the end because we're not at the end, but we're in the middle of a long line of application of commercial practices to traditional state run space activities. Uh, and that's partly because we now understand after decades of government investment where there are places we can take risk, you know, or not or not take, but we're also able to leverage all sorts of adjacent technologies from cloud computing to communications to uh, you know uh, new materials for, for design and, and things like that. Uh, it, it strikes me as interesting that you know we, we can categorize rough communities in the space area. I've traditionally looked at what I call disruptors for traditional commercial space missions, inventors for new ones, and then infrastructure builders. But what's interesting is that there is as much dynamic change when I look at communications and remote sensing and weather, uh, you know, the, the old fashioned uh, commercial space sectors. Uh, there's as much change in those sectors as there are in things related to the lunar economy and manufacturing and space and things like that. And so it's really important to pay attention to those because 
I think there's open running room, you know, in, in one of my historically favorite areas, remote sensing that I've been working on for almost three decades. You know, we're nowhere near full appreciation of the impact of new kinds of geospatial data into the economy. You know, we've grown accustomed to some of it, but I think there's a long way to still go. Communications is the same thing. You know, there's still people on earth that either have no communications or minimal communications that want more, and those that have some want better communications, faster, et cetera. So these areas are moving, you know, just as, as quickly as, as, as uh, you know, many of the newer missions that we sometimes talk about. Um, it's never as exciting to talk about data as it is to see an image of a rocket blasting off of a pad, but data is very much, you know, part of the, the, the revolutionary as, aspects of how space is transforming, not only what we understand about the universe, but, but about our lives. But last point I'll make on this is to, when you think about the entrepreneur in this space, you know, in the old days, if I were an entrepreneur with an idea, good or bad, um, I had to wait five years for launch. I had to spend a lot of money for launch. Mm -hmm. Today, I can actually develop an idea, get it into space within six months. Maybe it doesn't work, or maybe I found a new way to make it work better. Uh, work better. And so there's a, there's a speed here that actually is coming in the space economy that's going to allow us to innovate at a much more rapid pace. And by the way, there's a finance aspect of that as well. We, we can come back to a little bit. Absolutely. When you say getting something in in space within six months, I'm I would ask about the sustainability question, but we will come to that late, late, later on. Sure. Um, um, when I hear you correctly, you say it's all healthy where we are going, so we are not heading the next bubble. Correctly summarized or misinterpreted. So, so the word we hear these days, of course, is consolidation. And uh, you know, folks use prominent examples like mast in space. They use examples like Virgin Orbit, and and so you know, consolidation is inevitable. Uh, if I can stick with our our original theme for the the thirty three minutes, you know, uh, no one ever said there wouldn't be challenges or perhaps more appropriately mm -hmm. speed bumps or potholes on the pathway to the trillion dollar space economy. And so consolidation is inevitable. Not everybody will win. There will be winners and losers. And what we're starting to see, you know, in some ways, this is a, this is very much a positive development. We're starting to see normal market behavior for space. It's it's not that unique, bespoke. It's only done one way that we were accustomed to in the past. We're seeing different different aspects here. My thinking on this actually dates back to the start of the COVID pandemic where the space industry not only showed itself to be very resilient, but also playing an outsized role in helping us, the globe, mitigate uh, the effects of the pandemic. Uh, and so we're seeing different aspects. Uh, now we have a different set of challenges with the changes in the global economy, changes, you know, a war underway, a terrible war underway uh, that are also impacting the sector. Uh, and, and that's also an interesting case for, for this discussion. Um, I think what's different in this market is that we're now starting to be able to reconcile these on a commercial basis. I remember in the early days of remote sensing in the mid-90s, the late 90s, uh, one of the, the worries that at least the U.S. government has was to say, well, gee, if one of these early, early companies fails, I'm going to have to pick up the pieces. And, and there's no... There's probably no worse scenario than the government having to pick up the pieces. And that's everything from on-orbit assets to archival data, et cetera. We're now starting to see these dealt with on a commercial basis. So in the case of Maston, if I'm remembering correctly, Athrobotic acquired those, those assets. In the case of Virgin Orbit, Rocket Lab and Firefly acquired those. Or and, and those will be dealt with on a much more efficient basis. Uh, and so consolidation isn't a good thing for everybody, but at the end of the day, it will likely make the space market and the space economy stronger because those that survive will be will, will be stronger almost by definition and maybe get to benefit from those that didn't quite make it. I just remember, uh, was it one, two years ago, um, OneWeb, it was uh, taking up 
partially by the by the UK government because I mean at the end they have to yeah and now are on there more potent and more strong than than ever before I would say in my humble opinion as a non-economist um in your um space economy inside podcast you and Emma will be focused on new market space market segments such as the recent one on food was or uh, was met and then medicine and space does every company need a space vision i mean that was also one of the the points in the uh, in the paper of uh, of Shinette. yeah i i think that uh we'll, we'll come to the issue of whether every company needs a space vision but what i'm really excited about and why i continue to be optimistic that mm -hmm. we'll get to that trillion dollar space economy even more is that we're starting to see the real involvement of people not traditionally involved in space paying attention and actually spending money in this space. And so let's give ourselves credit. Uh, you know, the first decades of space innovation were largely about conversations between space people. Okay, Now we're starting to see the involvement of many, many other sectors, uh, whether it be mining, whether it be agriculture, whether it be, as you said, on our, our most recent uh, episode of Space Economy Insights, uh, we had Matt Gilliam, who was talking about food and medicine production in space, you know, as a necessity of getting as deep into space as we can, you know, that that's really important. So we're seeing experiments in these areas. And what we absolutely know, past experience shows us is that we're going to benefit as much back here on Earth by understanding better how some of these processes work. Again, when we talk with Matt on uh, on Space Economy Insights, about some of the benefits coming back here on Earth uh, from doing these kinds of experiments in space. Uh, the thing we haven't talked about yet at all is the moon. And uh, you know we might mark 2022, 2023 as the start of the lunar economy. Uh, you know we saw the the the, the, the brave valiant iSpace attempt and uh, you know did not succeed, but they stood back up and said we're coming right back uh, you know in a, with, with another mission in the next couple of years. I'll be in Tokyo next week to to talk to them about that. But think of it this way, there are a hundred missions planned for the moon over the next decade. And so if you're a skeptic, you might say, let's say 20, 25 percent of those either don't go, don't succeed, don't have enough money, whatever it would be. We're still going to learn a tremendous amount about about the moon specifically. But what I also believe is we're going to learn a lot about things we can do on Earth. We're starting to see some some entrepreneurs are focused on doing things on the moon that we don't do as well on Earth. And so I think we're going to learn an awful lot just by by virtue of going back to uh, to our, our most distant neighbor here and uh, living there sustainably. Uh, you know, the other point I'd make on this is that when we went to the moon for a week period of time, you could pretty much put up with anything in terms of food and boredom and things like that. When we go back sustainably, we're going to have at least some of the creature comforts of home and, uh, you know, whatever those may be. And we're seeing entrepreneurs from other sectors paying attention to those kind of things as well. Right. I want to come back to the space sustainability topics. Um, I mean, that's one of the topics that we have talking a lot about lately in the uh, Secure World Foundation Summit in, in New York or the Paris Air Show, as you mentioned earlier. So how do you see the role of the commercial market emerging here? Because some would could say it's a governmental thing to control, to observe, to Keep it clean. Yeah, you you know this is one of my favorite topics, and so uh, <laughs> I appreciate you asking the question. You know, I, I the way I think about this is first of all, it, it's uh, it's a very positive sign that there's now so much attention being paid to space safety and sustainability. Yeah, you know, I remember a time when it was much less so, and uh, you know that's that's all good news. Uh, people focused on many different ways to improve safety and sustainability, either not creating new debris, improving our understanding of the space environment, 
uh, focusing on the rules and road rules of the road that we'll need to make sure we stay safe, just like we do when we're driving down the street together. Uh, and so there's a lot of initiative in a lot of different areas. Um, that said, when you have a fast changing problem like the space debris problem, uh, you really had to leverage the private sector as a key element of this. And I've said this for many years. And, uh, you know, what we see in the United States is we see a vibrant ecosystem of, you know, probably a dozen companies that's focused in this area. Last week at the Paris Air Show, we saw some announcements on the private side of, uh, you know, investments in, in some of the European startups in this area. But we're also seeing government activities, uh, you know, move along the lines of rules and norms and, and, and things like that. Uh, the geopolitical environment that we're living in is, is necessarily impacting our ability to reach global agreement on these things, but it can't be an excuse for us not to move together as like-minded partners and allies, you know, to really make as positive an influence on, on space sustainability as we possibly can. But I think there's an enormous play here. What historically was a government-only function also now needs to benefit from the many different developments on the private side. Again, everything from data management, cloud computing, advanced analytics, and mm -hmm. you're going to have to be able to move at speed as satellites and other things are going into space at an unprecedented rate. I think the most recent fact, uh, figure I saw was that uh, uh, upwards of 100,000 satellites have been licensed to fly by the end of this decade. I mean, that's just a very rapidly changing market. And so again, the private sector here is really important. It, I would argue the most important tool in the toolkit to do this. Last point on this, Torsten, is that sometimes I hear people say that, gee, once we get, get the space safety issue uh, under wraps, you know, once we solve it, whatever that means, uh, we'll be finished. Uh, and I couldn't disagree more. Uh, you know, once we get space safety in tow and improve people's ability to 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 space, stay safe in space, I think that gives way to a whole host of other foundational services, mostly commercial, in my view. You know, that will will form the the basis for the growth in the space economy. Uh, but this is a problem that we do have to continue to deal with very urgently because it puts at risk the lives of the astronauts, it puts at risk the billions of dollars and euros we've invested, and it also puts at risk all of the good things we're talking about. We won't, we won't need to count uh, if there's you know, a terrible disaster in space uh, for lots of reasons. So really an important topic we need to stay focused on. Absolutely, and I can't admit, envision a scenario that we have Space safety and security, as you mentioned, solved in a way. I mean, right. it, it's an it's a it's a living organism, a so to absolutely. say. Yeah, and I mean, yep. even everything is controlled by AI, and collision avoidance is managed in an appropriate way. And we have STM in place, fine, but we have uh, we have still the unknown unknowns that can hit us from the back, or the elements that are too tiny to to be detected and so on and so forth. So um, I think that that will even gr grow and it will never be solved in this way, but that's my humble opinion on that. It, it's a very dynamic problem and we're gonna continue to work it from different perspectives for, for decades to come. So before we get Emma back here, um, also with hopefully some questions from the audience. Excuse me for that. So what are we doing with all this information about the space economy now? I mean, we have now these wells of, of knowledge and, or, and, and insights got presented. What are we doing with that? How do you advise your clients? I mean, you can say that because we are in our cozy sure. coffee shop here, so nobody <laughs> is taking notes. So, so let's let's actually first go back to where we started. Yeah. Uh, you know, we we know we have to improve uh, our ability to account for developments in the space economy, and I think that simply comes to us agreeing on what we count and how we count it. Uh, I don't I don't think this is all that difficult 
uh, love the work that's going on right now in this area. Rather than complain about it, I hope people will more productively actually help those that are trying to do uh, a better job, uh, you know, accounting it. Um, and because those are important data for government managers, investors, entrepreneurs, even regulators, uh, they really are important at some top level. But in terms of at the at the the, the, the client level or the individual person organizational level, I don't think that people wake up every morning wondering about the hundred, you know, the trillion dollar space economy or the three trillion dollar space economy. I think they wake up inspired by the ability to do something interesting and innovative. They wake up thinking, boy, if I actually can achieve this, uh, I can actually help with security. I can help with safety. Uh, I can improve economics on Earth, you know, productivity in a tremendous way. And so at that level, you know, the, the emphasis is on make sure you stay focused. You know, we've seen a lot of places where people have been unfocused and they have to get focused very, very quickly. The environment has changed. It will change again. There's no doubt about it. But stay focused on what you're trying to do. Understand your market. Understand your competitors. I, I sometimes chuckle when, when we ask an early stage company, who are your competitors? And they say, well, we don't have any. Well, yes, you do. OK, yeah. understand the market you're in. Understand the competitors uh, and stay as focused as you can in running a successful business, you know, that uh, that can take us to a whole new area uh, in terms of safety, security and efficiency. So uh, I don't think it's more complicated than that. Uh, but I remain optimistic about uh, what's going on in the space economy. And, and we will hit that trillion dollar space economy at some point in the not too distant future. Got it. What gets Kevin up in the morning and get excited, gets excited? Just thinking about the space economy, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Emma, do you have some interesting yes. questions from our we audience? We have a couple is of questions. Is our audience engaged today? Yes, yes, we have a I couple of so. very good questions. It's Kevin, I do get up in the morning thinking about the trillion stuff. I'm very <laughs> materialistic. <laughs> but it's lira. You're, you're, you're thinking about trillion liras. Uh, no, 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 I'm set on US dollars, don't worry. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, we have a very nice question, very interesting by Christian and Fried, and Fried or and Fried, I don't know if it's American or German, it might be Anfried or Austrian. Austrian, Austrian okay, so Anfried. It's a exactly. colleague of Valentin. Nice to meet you, Christian. <laughs> colleagues of Valentine's are my colleagues. You know Christian very well, absolutely. <laughs> Hi, Christian. Uh, how much of the financial investment in the space economy is R&D and how much is actual operations? Does the significant increase in funding over the past years led to a significant increase in R&D too? Or is it more or less harvesting existing technology, including covering the risk of failure, like risk investment or value investment? So it, it's a great question. I, I don't know that I or anyone else has a statistic on the nature of that investment. One of the things I'll observe is that uh, in, in, re, in the recent, in the last year, uh, we're seeing the extent to which funds are going into operations. In fact, I'm starting to see investors ask the question, is this company investing more as much as they need to in R&D? You know, we're worried that they're spending too much of the investment on operations and not thinking about the future, competitive advantage and, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, but I think, Christian, you know, as good as the question is, I think it also depends a lot. If I'm in the broadband satellite communications business, it's a very different answer than if I'm in the lunar mining area. So. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know anybody that has that kind of statistics. That's exactly the kind of data you want to collect. I think we spoke with Claire about that on, on Space Economy Insights. You know, to what extent is money going into R&D? Uh, but it's another category where we really need to do a better job capturing data and making sure the methodologies we use to count it are rigorous. Thank you very much. Uh, we have... Sorry. I'm looking forward to Harald's uh, question. Yeah, we're having Harald. 
we, we didn't know if we put it into our, yeah, our exactly. rundown. And we, Harald, you're so, really poking us. Yeah. Because and we thank you very much for this, this. report. We, we, we discussed it yesterday. Uh, Harald, uh, hi, Kevin. How Torsten? Harald here from To Be Ahead. Thanks a lot for your insights, uh, Kevin. I think some of the optimistic projections on the future of space economy are based on the success of the Starship. Do you think this is an accurate statement? What would happen if the Starship failed? Thank you, Harald. Very interesting question. Very interesting question. And I have to say, I, I respectfully disagree. Uh, you know, what I see, and, and maybe I didn't speak to it as clearly enough, is I, I see so many new market segments emerging that really have, and, and it's not one person doing work in a new segment. You know, sometimes people ask us about space medicine. And, uh, you know, the joke historically was, Kevin, what are you talking about five NASA and ESA doctors? The answer is no, there's 70 organizations worldwide that are involved in looking at space medicine. So while I understand the excitement about focusing on Starship, I don't think that any of the estimates hinge specifically on that. Uh, it'll be unfortunate if Starship fails because I think that has the potential to give us a, a quantum leap, if you will above and beyond, but we see so many people invested broadly and deeply in so many other market segments that if, if uh, you know, heaven forbid, Starship fails, uh, we will continue to explore using other launch modes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think the ecosystem is robust enough that uh, you know, we'll, con we'll continue to see progress. I, I don't, and frankly, at last point, I don't know that uh, I've seen any estimates that expressly include Starship as the the accelerator, if you will, of of the uh, of the space economy. That's Thank interesting. You. We in our last space cafe Israel by uh, Meda Pariente, he had um, Lior Hermann, a um, uh, venture capitalist uh, from yep. Type Five, uh, in the room, and he was asked. He asked exactly the same question, and he responded the same. He said, "It doesn't matter." For the egg. So it's just, or even, even the, the prices of, of launch will go up or go down. It doesn't matter. It's just one element in your um, in your value chain. So and it was interesting. It correlates absolutely with what you just said, Kevin. Remember, we're, we're going to start to move from a paradigm of, you know, we talk about space, as I said earlier, you know, the image of the rocket blasting off is is always the compelling image that they put on commercials and things like that. I think we're going to start to see an equal amount of effort on what I'll call platforms in space, yeah. you know, whether it be the commercial space stations or uh, refueling or inspection or on orbit servicing. Uh, and, you know, in my spaces about economics way, tell you that will change the economics of space yet again, like developments in the launch industry did. Um, and so I think we're going to start to see different developments, not to say it doesn't matter, because we still have a popular image of space and its importance that we have to get over. And so if we see dramatic failures, that's actually not, not positive. Um, and so, but I think at the end of the day, this trend is already underway and is sufficiently broad and deep that it won't depend on only one factor there. Now, Starship succeeds, you might have an accelerant yeah. to what we're talking about, but uh, that's the way I say it. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Kevin. So Next we question. Have to, yes, we have to sorry. No. To speed up, our, our production team is raising yellow flags. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. 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 Uh, no, sorry. Not red flags yet, but okay, we just got let it run. We, we have be fun. Okay, so Christophe is a complex question. I know his thoughts, so he wants to bounce with you. He's kind of a principal and wants to know if you agree or not. Okay. The devil is in the details of the, sorry, the devil is in the details of building a company and surviving the market. Massive cost reduction of access to space is transformational, but it is far from being the whole story and is only one of the factors behind an investment decision. For a use case to reach critical mass within a specific space market, execution isn't about mere vision, but customer-centric adoption as part of an economically viable value chain. Do you agree or not with this? Oh, to totally agree. It's, it's not about any one factor. 
Uh, it's certainly about having a vision, but it's also really being able to execute behind that vision. One of the things that people often don't pay enough attention to is the, is the quality and diversity of the team. You know, when an investor looks at a team, they may hear a vision, but if they don't see someone on a team that actually understands how to manage money, they often turn away and say, whoops, you know, I, I like that person, but uh, if I invest and they get hit by a bus, uh, my money is lost, you know, so you really have to show diversity, you have to show experience in execution, and that's one of the things, you know, we're seeing narratives about SpaceX veterans that have gone on to start other things, and as, as just one example of that, but it's a it's a much more complicated thing, understanding who your customers are as well as the, as the question suggests. Thank you, Kevin. Quickly, in your view, what are the fields that will develop more beyond communication, earth observation, and navigation? So I think those are the, what I call the traditional areas. Yes, I think so. weather weather is certainly ripe for not only ripe, but it's also badly needed. You know, more precise understanding of weather. Uh, but we're also seeing a whole variety of things related to to the lunar missions. Uh, we're seeing, again, both the, the technical side, we need a whole set of infrastructure on the moon that may be different from the way we do it on Earth. It's similar to, but not exactly the same. Uh, we need some of the human dimensions uh, as we're going to increase human space flight. Uh, and then there are a whole host of people who are going to do what I'll call infrastructure development. And it's everything from uh, you know, looking at the use of, of uh, say, quantum key encryption in space, I mean, there's a whole range of areas we could talk about as unique space market segments where people are already investing and developing solutions for things. Last one, guys. So we keep the production happy. The UN, okay. This is by B. Harvey. The UN effort of keeping the skies clear could impact the launches of the already planned satellites. So Brian, nice to nice to see you here. Uh, even in the question, uh, you know, I think uh, all of the efforts, you know, that we have underway are are positive efforts. The devil is in the details there. To steal from a previous question, you know, how are we going to manage this? Uh, you've heard me talk many times about regulation, whether it be international or national. My real concern is that we do this based on real world data uh, associated with launches not just have well-intended regulation. Uh, and so how we reconcile these, anything happening at the UN these days is complicated by the fact that the geopolitical situation is, is obviously very, very complicated. Uh, you, you have to include Russia and China in these discussions, but needless to say, agreement is far apart. So uh, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll hold on that answer. Could talk a lot more about it. We'll take it offline. But we should do a shootout to today's uh, newly announced uh, director of UNO, Sarah, yeah. our RT um, Holler, uh, who has a really a big job in front of her. And um, yeah, we can only wish her good luck. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic, Kevin. Thank you very much, Torsten. Thank too. You. I think is it my my is my is on me, right? The next step, Torsten. I think. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks a lot to our fantastic speaker, to Torsten. But before we say goodbye, allow me to remind you of the upcoming events: the 29th of June, at 8 p.m. chess time, so evening uh, meeting. We have in the 65th Space Bar by Astro Agency. On the 30th of June at 4 p.m. says time, it's Asteroid Day, and Space Cafe Benelux will be back with host Dr. Heike Poignant, featuring a conversation with Dr. Harald Hauschild about how optical and quantum communication will shape the future of space. I probably mispronounced both of them. I apologize for that. I thought it was good. Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> On the 5th and 6th of July, Torsten will be in Brussels at the Space Forum. Good trip to, um, to Brussels, Torsten. On the 6th of July at 3 p.m. chess time, we're going to have a Space Cafe Brazil with the, our Ian Grossner. With the, the guest will be the ex-Portugal Minister of Higher Education, the Professor Manuel Heitor, discussing how space innovation helps the people. Amazing. This is such a high 
uh, profile guests. We are really looking forward for uh, Ian Grossner. Yes, tell and me. Ian is, Ian, is in, Ian is in the house, so greetings to Brazil. Ian, gre greetings. Nice to see you here. And we are, we have been discussing to us and ideas. You have fantastic guests. Well done. Uh, 7th of July at 4 p.m. chess time, exceptionally on a Friday, Space Cafe 33 minutes with Dr. Josef Ashbacha. And guess who is going to be your interviewer? It's going to be myself. So I'm going to present the first Space Cafe 33 minutes. And what a guest. I'm going to start with the president of the European Space Agency, the sorry, the director general of the European Space Agency. So don't miss it. Okay. Uh, come to support even just to, you know, support a bit my first Space Cafe 33 minutes with. And I would love to see you all there. 26th of July, 2023, at 4 p.m. CEST time, so always European summer time, Space Cafe Black Ops. No, we're not going to be on the 26th of July with Namrata, Torsten. We're going to be at the end of August because we're waiting aye, for aye, some aye. Indian policy. So no problem. Scrap that. Wait for Black Ops because we have postponed it because we're having some news from India coming soon. And the next episode will be on India. So yeah. we're going to be one month later after the summer holidays. I said it. You hear it here from the source. It's okay, exactly. So <laughs> like, <laughs> I can say it, absolutely. Sorry about this. 27 of July in the morning for everyone that loves a bit of space slow uh, breakfast uh, with uh, Professor Stephen Freeland, 27 of July, 9.30. Oh, no, p.m. Sorry, p.m. for us usually is in the morning. It's in the morning. It's a.m. Ah, it's a.m. Okay, okay. It's, so that p.m. was confusing me. Okay, it's nine thirty a.m. I was okay. Usually, it's it's because morning. Excel is in uh, in Toulouse or uh, oh, and and Ingo in Cologne. So All right. We are... No problem. Yes. A.m. Uh, with the Stephen Freeland and demystifying space law for you, together with experts Axel Cartier and Dr. Ingo Baumann. There you go. Another fantastic breakfast with Stephen. And as usual, all the events are going to be online on Eventbrite, don't miss them out. And of course, as usual, um, interact with us, send us your feedbacks, contact us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up for our daily and bi-weekly newsletter when you can get all the news, all the articles, all the podcasts directly in your mailbox. And if you would like to really treat yourself by something special which is our amazing merchandising on our website so become a space watcher today and buy a t-shirt <laughs> or help us in the supporter program of course kevin thank you very much it's always a thank pleasure you. to hear you you are an incredible source of knowledge and you can explain it to everyone you always make me feel like i'm an expert even if i'm definitely not there yet um thank you thank you to our audience to torsten for being with us and allow me to be uh, a proud housekeeper thank you of course to the production to frank uh, uh, behind the screen the helping us to put this together and making sure that uh, we, we we pretend to look professional and of course uh, i hope to see all of you next week in the upcoming events in the meantime visit us don't forget about us and uh, tweet us if you can and another one don't forget to become a space watchers <laughs> i think i said it five times <laughs>